last speaker of today is Dr. Rob Dunbar. He received his PhD in 1981 from the University of California, San Diego. He then joined the faculty on Rice University for a number of years, after which he moved to Stanford University in 1997, where he now resides. And he is currently the Keck Professor of Earth Science, Professor of Environmental Earth Science Systems, the J. Frederick and Elizabeth B. Wentz University Fellow in Undergraduate <coughs> Education, the Director of the Stanford University Stable Ice Cream <coughs> Program, a Senior Fellow in the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies, a Senior Fellow in the Woods Institute for <laughs> the Environment, and last but not least, Chair of the Board of Trustees for the Consortium of Open Leadership in Washington, D.C. So today's talk is entitled Fire and Ice, Tales of Climate Change, Past, Present, and Future, From the Tropics to the Poles. Welcome. Great, thanks. All right. <clears throat> can you guys hear me OK in the back? All right in the back row, you can hear me fine. Good, thanks. Um, well, thanks for having me here. I, yesterday, I was looking at the list of who's here today at uh, University of South Florida and the survey office, and I, I recognized a lot of names. I came here quite a bit in the early 80s and a little bit uh, in the, I guess, late 90s, early 2000s, partly when Terry Quinn was here. And I've always enjoyed uh, visits, and I love what people are doing here. So I'm very much enjoying getting to meet some of you guys. Um, a little different. A little bit about myself. I'm a climate scientist and biogeochemist. Um, these are places where we work. And I mean, there's how many of you are students here? So, OK, there you go. So I mean, to be frank, honest about this, you know, I do like to travel. I mean, it did, it did motivate a lot of, uh, you know, how I got into what I do. I'm a field scientist, uh, but there is some uh, reason behind the rhymes here too. These are sites where we look at both shallow water corals and deep sea corals and they span this really critical part of the global ocean, the Western Pacific Warm Pool. Uh, you know, it's, it's the area where the water is above 28 degrees centigrade. There's this kind of convective limit element to that. It's much larger than North America. And this thing expands and contracts. It gets thicker, it gets thinner and has a fundamental control on, on global climate. So sites like this are oriented to let us look at time series changes in that feature. Um, we've been working along the Antarctic coast here quite a bit, some of it with Eugene and, and Amelia. And, uh, and again, that's part of, you know, the, a lot of our atmospherics are driven by the temperature gradient between the warmest parts of the planet and the coldest parts of the planet. So just developing an understanding um, of, of the range and variability in those systems is important. Uh, for me, you know, I guess my personal frontier these days is in the carbon system. Most of my newest work is very high precision measurements of carbon system chemistry in tropical environments. Uh, but today I actually wanted to talk about uh, some frontiers in paleo science, in part because the University of South Florida has had a long tradition of producing excellent um, paleoclimate work, and you've got some really outstanding uh, paleoclimate scientists here today. But I'll give you a few perspectives on, on uh, what's going on. This is the class I'm teaching right now. I'm teaching every day this quarter, except for these <laughs> two days that I'm here. I'm teaching down in uh, Hopkins, so it's called Stanford at Sea. We take uh, 25 Stanford undergraduate students out to sea on this 130-foot uh, tall ship. So we're all flying to Tahiti on the 1st of May and we'll pull into Honolulu on the 10th of June after visiting some of the world's most remote reef systems in the Lion Islands. So today I've got two stories really. We'll talk a little bit about corals, ways that we use coral skeletons to track climate change, and also uh, a little bit about what's going on in Antarctica. And this question is pretty important. How often and how fast does the ice melt? And I, you know, here in Florida, I mean, you should be very interested in the Antarctic ice sheet and support science that helps us understand the ice sheet. Uh, I'm, sure some of, I'm sure this will be offensive to someone. This is a very simplistic view of the link between sea level and climate change. Uh, David Archer started this, but I added a couple of dots here. It's pretty simple. Sea level relative to today 
and global mean temperature. We know what that is today. There we are, bullseye. And we know this number pretty well. We know the sea level lowering 20,000 years ago. What we don't know quite as well was global average temperature, but it's encapsulated somewhere in that range. Uh, we're closing in on what the world looked like in the Pliocene in terms of temperatures, 22 meters higher than today, sea level, and then the Eocene uh, 40 million years ago, uh, little to no continental ice. And, and the thing that struck me about this is, you know, you can actually draw a line through there. Is this a fundamental constant for the, you know, the Neogene world or the Cenozoic world, rather? 22 meters per degree centigrade. Probably not. I mean, again, this is a cartoon view, but it does suggest strong sensitivity of global sea level to even fairly minor changes in temperature. IPCC gives us a production out here of around one meter of sea level rise with this amount of warming. Is that realistic? It's far from equilibrium, right? So the question is, how fast can this system respond? Okay, so uh, before we go into the past, we'll start with a little bit of the present. This came out of the New York Times. Everybody knows now 2014 was the warmest year on record. It says here challenging the global warming skeptics, but you know, we have many different data sets now. Global average temperature, you know, the Met, Met Office in the UK, NOAA, NASA, even Richard Mueller's Berkeley Earth Temperature Project has kind of come up with uh, strong consistency with these global time series and temperature. So this is from instrumental data. There's 2010, a little bit warmer than 2000, or 2014, a little bit warmer than 2010, a little bit warmer than 2005, not very much. People make a big deal about the, the so-called pause, but you know, you look at the big picture, it just doesn't look like much of a pause, right? I don't think it's anything to write home about. Um, so that's the instrumental record. Now, Yale University, they have this project on climate change communication, and <laughs> it's Yale University project on cli no, <laughs> climate change communication. So this, uh, they published this thing in Nature Climate Change uh, just a couple, three days ago, right? It's up on the web now, so you can go in and see, you know, different metrics of belief and, and aspects of global change. So this one is estimated percentage of adults who think global warming is happening. It's not whether it's caused by men, it's just like, do you believe the thermometers, right? So uh, the range is pretty substantial. On average, 63% of Americans believe the thermometer record. Uh, Florida as a state is pretty close to the average. Uh, the, the outliers here would be the District of Columbia and Hawaii. That's where there's the greatest acceptance that the planet's actually warming up. Why is that? California is pretty bad with 70%. And you can drill down on counties, right? So if you go into Florida County by county, you know, 63%, but, but you're doing a little bit better. You know, two-thirds of the people that live here think the planet's warming up. Not quite as good as Miami-Dade. And then I'm not sure what's going on in this county here, but, <laughs> but that has the lowest uh, belief and of course, then you move into Alabama and Mississippi and strength. I mean, there's places here, you know, the end member here is about 20% of the people in particular counties actually think that the planet is getting warmer. I mean, that's really something you can't argue about. Now, part of it is things like this are happening. You know, there's James N. Hoffa with his famous snowball. I was in Washington then, and we were meeting with senators and Congress people to talk about climate change, but he did this thing with the snowball you know, that's evidence that global warming can't be happening. It's March, I picked the snow up. And his own hometown newspaper, you know, <laughs> they wrote that they considered him to be an embarrassment, right? But you know, a lot of people listen to him and, and he, he communicates effectively with a, a set of Americans. Um, similar things are happening here in Florida. You guys have lived, lived this and have probably had a good chuckle or two. I saw one recently, it was this article in Salon, you know. <laughs> Did you, have any of you seen this YouTube video? Like they're just, they're trying to get him to say the words climate change. <laughs> and he just won't, but now again, what is the issue that we're talking about? And he won't say it, so. <laughs> anyway, okay, so the next part of their survey, this is the estimated percentage of adults who think global warming is mostly caused by human activities. Uh, again, you know, the high points would be DC, and Hawaii, Florida, 50, 50%, 50, 50, that's not too bad. Wyoming is the end member low. And if you break it down by county again, 
uh, you know, again, it's the highest in Miami-Dade. You guys are right at the national average. And then here's this county again, so <laughs> who knows what's going on there. Um, it's even more interesting if you look at uh, what people think about sinus. This is estimated percentage of adults who believe that most scientists think that global warming is happening. Now, this isn't connected to human cause. It's just, do they think global warming is happening? And I find this remarkable, you know, the global, that the average is around 41%. I mean, that's lower than they themselves think, <laughs> right? <laughs> How can that be? Does it reflect the fundamental mistrust of scientists? You know, I don't think so. I mean, there's a lot of ideology that goes into these things. Um, and we could have a completely separate discussion on that. I do want to say, you know, one thing that I've been able, I've been really happy to work with Jackie Dixon on in Washington is like, well, you know, carry this conversation forward in a respectful way and focus on the importance of the oceans in driving or ameliorating climate change. And we're doing the best that we can to try to keep federal funding going for research in the ocean sciences. But I mean, it, it can't stop there. It has to then percolate into community understanding of the climate system. Okay, so here's the status uh, right now, 2015. There's this huge knowledge gap between what's understood, that I would say that's by scientists, what's known by the public. Um, it, try as we might, it's difficult to reach a vast cross-section of America. Uh, there are a lot of facts in play as though they are opinions. You see that almost every day when climate change comes up in the Senator, the House. And uh, in these days, it's very clear that you know, opposition to regulation is actually driving the political discourse and scientific fact, theory models, they, they're subsidiary to that basic understanding. Uh, that actually gives us an entry point um, in the dialogue, but again, that's a discussion for another day. I think the things we need to worry about, is there a planetary emergency? We know more now about climate inertia than we did 10 or 15 years ago. There's a lot of inertia built into the system already. You know, this is along the lines of we stop emitting CO2, the planet's still going to warm up. And then uh, tipping points. And that's where some of the paleo climate uh, research is so important because it illustrates how climate changes slowly and then all of a sudden there's a fundamental change. West Antarctica melts rapidly. Well, we can use the paleo climate records to understand are we approaching a tipping point? How often do they happen? I mean, the general rule is things happens slowly and then all of a sudden it changes. That's the record from paleoclimate analyses over uh, many time frames. But there is some good news. Um, it's not too late. I guess you could say it's never going to be too late. It can always be worse. That's true. But I prefer to look at it in a more positive way. And then, of course, energy solutions have uh, multiple other benefits. Uh, one big misconception that we hear all the time, uh, Senator Inhofe used it the other day, that you know, it's all, what's happening now is all part of a natural cycle. And the fact is, you know, we've been looking at corals, sediment cores, ice cores, tree rings, you know. I mean, we have a pretty good handle on natural variability, certainly for the last thousand years or so, maybe even 2,000. And we're working pretty hard to extend that back through the Holocene now. And I guess what, you know, on average, uh, the normal decadal variability is changes in global temperature uh, of about 0.2 to 0.4 degrees. So if, you're ex if you exceed that, maybe there's something different going on. And then, again, on average, I'm going to show you some data sets that show something different, but on average, the planet's been cooling for most of the last 6,000 years until the late 1800s. And we think that's when the anthropogenic uh, transient kicks in. So there's a bunch of natural causes of climate change. You've got people here that study a number of these things, changes in ocean circulation, you know, the day after tomorrow <laughs> effect. Uh, volcanoes, uh, we know the solar constant is not a constant, and then higher frequency air-sea interactions. Those are all natural uh, sources of climate variability, and there are these man-induced uh, causes. So land use change ref changes the albedo of the planet. Aerosols do different things at different latitudes and elevations, and of course, trace gases. And it's not just CO2, right? It's methane and ozone and oxides of sulfur and nitrogen. And you know, when Bush Jr. came into office, in his first year, he assembled this blue ribbon panel. Ralph Cicerone, I think, was the chair of it. Uh, people like Richard Lindzen served. I mean, it was skeptics and 
people that were, you know, thinking about this for a long time. But he, you know, he asked him a series of 13 questions. You can look them up. Um, and one of the questions is, is man-made uh, CO2 causing global warming? Pretty complicated question, though, because if you're going to make an attribution to one component, you actually have to knock down the, the component due to methane and ozone, all of these human-induced changes, as well as the natural variability, right? So it took them about six months reading thousands of papers, and they reported back to President Bush at the beginning of his second year in office, yes, Mr. President, we all agree, Richard Lindzen too, we all agree, man-made CO2 is causing global warming. Now, that, you probably haven't heard that much about it, but there was a press conference, and you know, he came out and said, well, it's real, my scientists tell me it's real, now we're just going to learn to adapt to it. Right? So that was the response. Um, so, back to natural variability. Uh, this is an assembly. It came out in, in IGPP in their pages bulletin, but it's an assembly of temperatures of the last thousand years from different kinds of archives, tree rings, corals. There's some sediments in there. And uh, in here, you can see in general the trends been down towards cooling conditions, and then at the end, rapid warming, and the red is the instrumental record there. Uh, and again, you can see the natural variability pre-anthropogenic is on the order of two to four degrees centigrade, right? So this is the kind of insight that comes from uh, paleo. They, you know, this got called the hockey stick because here's the blade and here's the shaft. But it's still kind of a, it's an iconic figure that's still controversial. It shouldn't be controversial anymore because it's been replicated many times. So how do we know the natural variability? Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today about sediment cores and coral cores. And uh, just to point out, uh, you know, this is, I pulled this off of the NGDC website, and, and it shows where all these different kinds of archives, you know, lakes and speleothems, tree rings, pollen cores, ice cores, corals, you know, where do these things come from? It, it's lacking in the marine environment. We actually have a lot more marine cores than this. They're just not on there. But it does illustrate the preponderance of sites in North America and Western Europe and particularly in the Northern Hemisphere, and here's this vast area, largely oceanic, that really has yielded very few uh, sites for climate research. So that's a target of mine. I try to work in the Southern Hemisphere every year. And, um, and I like to work in the ocean, you know. The, the, so we're very interested in ocean heat content. Uh, this shows the accumulated energy in zeta joules for the ocean. Uh, in blue, the upper ocean in light blue, the deep ocean in dark blue uh, since uh, the early 80s, right? And so this is where the heat's going into the planet in terms of storage and reservoirs. Like the atmosphere, you can't even see that, right? There's this little tiny blip there, but, you know, the atmosphere doesn't hold heat, right? The atmosphere has very low heat capacity. The ocean has enormous heat capacity. So when people talk about the pause since 1998, I mean, I just don't see it. Right? You know, the oceans are accumulating heat. And so, it, in my view, we've got tens of thousands of records of atmospheric temperature, right? But we don't have many long term good records of temperature in the ocean. And there are archives that we can make use of that can remedy that, that situation. So, I'd like to know well, okay, this is an anomaly since 1980. We've got Argo Alice floats going up and down, measuring very accurately the temperature of the modern ocean, so the error bars are converging here towards the end of the record. But what about in deeper time? You know, what's the natural range in ocean heat content variability over centuries, right? If we know that, then we can tell definitively the degree to which this is unusual and different. So how do we do some of this? I'll show you some of the coral work now. Uh, one of the sites that we've been working is in American Samoa. Pretty interesting place. Um, you know, I got interested, I, I just heard this rumor that somebody had found the largest known coral colony on Earth. This was about 12 years ago, and my immediate thought was, let's coral! <laughs> and, uh, but I also wanted to verify it. Eventually a photograph was published of this thing, you know, almost 10 meters tall. 22, 24 meters in diameter, just absolutely massive. And it turned out, you know, it was kind of a sacred feature for the Samoan people. They called it Big Mama. <laughs> and I had written a proposal to drill Big Mama. <laughs> it's not 
a good situation. It took about six years of negotiating and meeting with the tribal chiefs and all this. Uh, but we got to go there. In part, I was looking for a long record that would go back many centuries, but it's actually in a pretty cool spot climatologically. It's not too far from the Nino 3.4 box. Uh, it's smack dab in the center of the South Pacific Convergence Zone. Um, we thought we might develop a record of uh, rainfall, but as it turned out, we're mainly recording temperature at this site. So temperature of the ocean, which of course feeds into uh, divergence and rainfall in the atmosphere. So here's the site, um, Ofu. Uh, there's no, <laughs> it's almost impossible to get to these things, and there are no restaurants or hotels or anything, right? But intriguingly, there's a NOAA buoy that ha records temperature very close to the site that we drilled. And this is America's newest national park, by the way, uh, the, America, the National Park of American Samoa, both islands. And uh, pretty place to go if you can get out there. So, Here's what it looks like. I mean, spectacular high island terrain. And um, we, well, we did some pilot coring in shallow water here, but, but uh, we'll be transported over to Big Mama here in a moment. There's Dave Mucciaroni, always showing off, you know, how strong he is. He can put his scuba tank on that way. I can't. <laughs> um, here it is. So there's our dive boat. Here it is, massive, 65 feet depth at the base. And we have this underwater hydraulic uh, rig. Uh, Eugene Shen's done a bunch of this stuff here. Uh, in fact, I learned how to do this with a bunch of people from Florida in the 70s. And we're still out there doing this. We've been drilling recently in Palau and Easter Island, also this site here. So there's, it's coming out like a big tube of limestone. Varieties, um, we're not killing the coral. People have been back and taken photographs, but we triple cord this thing. And there you get a sense, they, here's a weird growth morphology that the biologists there, they call it the tumor, but, but, but it's not. So just a different form of polyp growth. Uh, just massive thing. And so but our estimation started growing about 1,000 years ago. And we were able to drill with our equipment down about six meters. So you know, we got back over 500 years. Um, it took us six days to recover about 20 meters of core, triple cord it, and uh, then we fill up the holes when we're done so that bio eroders cannot get on the inside of this thing. And then we had our American Samoan colleagues come out and make sure that everything looked good. So you can see, you know, it's just, it's 